Hello, my name is Christy Jensen. I'm 28 years old and I'm from the Netherlands. Ciao, my name is Antonio Marsi. I am 29 years old and I am from Italy. Ni hao, my name is Ying Jie Qi. I'm 32 years old and I'm from China. My work studies monetary policy in economies with domestic and international production chains. I'm interested in the interaction between monetary policy and financial stability. My research is on the role of information choice in macroeconomics and finance. I'm interested in finance and development. I do research in banking and copy finance. My work is about the policies of the European Central Bank, which directly affect the risk premium on the sovereign debt of peripheral countries. I study how long-term investors change their bond holdings after a shift in regulation, and how these changes subsequently affected interest rates. I found that savers choose to get more information about which bank or product they should use for their saving in recessions. My work explores how voter preferences determine financial regulation focusing in particular on the role of political connections in this process. Well, welcome indeed also to uh, our Young Economists, the finalists of this year Young Economist competition. Um, as in previous years, each of the PhD students, which you just saw in the video, prepared a research paper and a poster, which you can find on our website. Forum participants are invited to vote on this research on the platform via, for which details have been announced via email. The voting will conclude at 8 a.m. tomorrow, and the winner will be awarded a prize of 10,000 euro at the end of the forum. Now, let me say two words about the program. In a couple of moments, we will start the sessions on the implications of fundamental global changes for central banks. We will conclude the day with a discussion on issues relevant for the ECB's monetary policy strategy review, such as central banks' inflation objective, structural forces, and communication. Tomorrow, we will then turn to the topic of macroeconomic stabilization frameworks with papers focusing on monetary policy and fiscal policy. And we'll discuss monetary policy instruments and financial stability, topics which are also highly relevant to the ongoing strategy review. This will be followed by the policy panel and the award ceremony for the Young Economist competition. By now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with online events, but nevertheless, I'll take the opportunity to briefly explain how the virtual forum will work today and tomorrow. First of all, all sessions and all panels will be on the record and webcast live. We encourage all of you to join the social media conversation and follow us on Twitter using the hashtag ECB Forum. Our participants will be able to interact live with our speakers during the Q&A sessions at the end of every session and paper presentation. I would just request that participants overall keep any questions to 90 seconds, as time overall will be rather limited. A word on tomorrow's policy panel, where forum participants can submit questions in advance via the email address they have received. But also, we'd like to encourage all of you who are following us to submit questions and comments for the policy panel via Twitter. And now, time to give the floor to the chair of our first session, Luis de Guindos, Vice President of the ECB. Vice President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thierry. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, to all the participants and viewers of the 2020 edition of the ECB Forum on Central Banking, I am very pleased uh, to chair the first session of the conference today. But before starting, let, let me, uh, if I may, give some housekeeping instructions and guidelines. We'll have, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, the presentation of the paper. The presenter will have, uh, you know, 20 minutes in order to, to introduce uh, uh, his third paper. And after that, uh, the paper will be discussed uh, 
by another person that will have uh, you know available 10, 10, 10 minutes. Finally, we will open you know the floor to to the audience for comments, uh, questions, and as Thierry has indicated, uh, you know I I would uh, I would ask you to limit your interventions to 90, 90 seconds. So, without any further delay, uh, we can we can we can start with the first session that is going to be dedicated to the implications of fundamental global changes for central, for central banks. Globalization or deglobalization, should it uh, have started to reverse, is a key structural change in the world economy and the first topic for discussion today. Professor Paul Andras from Harvard University will present the first paper entitled Deglobalization, Global Value Chains in the Post-COVID-19 Age. For that, uh, we scheduled 20 minutes, as I have said before. So, Paul, you have the floor. Greetings from uh, Boston. Uh, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be here and to speak about deglobalization. Now, let me give you a roadmap of what I want to do, basically three main objectives. I want to first review recent trends in the global economy and assess whether we might have entered a new phase of deglobalization and whether global value change, chains might be retrenching. Second, I want to study trade and GBC dynamics during the COVID-19 uh, health crisis. And then finally, I want to speculate on uh, the future of globalization uh, and of global value chains. Now, this builds on a background paper, which has been made available. It's a fairly long paper. I cannot cover it all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to structure my presentation around 10 uh, points that I think are the salient points of the paper. Now, the first couple of points are about facts, about uh, deglobalization facts. And the first point I want to make is that I think we should be, at this point in time, at least speaking more about slobalization, to use the economist's term, than deglobalization. In the paper, I look at a variety of measures of globalization, and certainly most, if not all of them, have shown a decline in their uh, growth, but not a decline in their levels. Take the left panel on the slide, which is showing you a standard measure of globalization, which is the world trade over world GDP ratio. That ratio grew dramatically in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, and since then, it's been pretty much stagnant around 30%. If we look at measures of GVC activity, per, for instance, the percentage of world trade that is accounted for by global value chains, that shows a very similar pattern, very fast increase in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, and stagnation, and even perhaps a mild decline in uh, recent years. In the paper, I look at migration, capital flows, multinational activity. You could look at a bunch of measures, and some have declined a bit more than others, but I think it's clear that we're you know, more in an area, era of globalization than of uh, deglobalization. The second point I want to make is that at some level, globalization was inevitable. What do I mean by that? Well, if you plot, uh, like I'm plotting here, the ratio of world trade to world GDP, this is a variable that one would expect cannot possibly grow forever. Uh, in plain words, or you know, somewhat imprecisely, but in plain words, these are variables that have natural upper bounds. They cannot be higher than 100%. So it's natural that even though you might go through phases of increased globalization, things should taper off sooner or later. Okay, so again, one, you know, one cannot possibly have extrapolated from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s and expect this to have continued over time. Now, that obviously begs the question of A, uh, what drove that hyper-globalization or extraordinary growth in the world trade to world GDP ratio in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and B, to what extent are these forces not at play anymore, are they at less play, or might it actually work in reverse to actually lead to a true process of deglobalization? So that brings me to the third point, which is assessing or, or discussing the drivers of hyper-globalization. In that respect, I would distinguish three main drivers. On the one hand, there was a technological driver, which was the information and communication technology revolution. There was a policy uh, driver, which was the acceleration in the signing of multilateral and especially regional trade agreements. And third, there was politics, uh, political developments that brought about a remarkable increase in the share of the world labor force that was employable from the point of view of firms in the West, in the capitalist West. 
So these forces worked in unison and basically they increased the demand by firms in the West of labor uh, in less developed economies because they could communicate more easily with them, transmit information, designs, et cetera. And at the same time, they could ship goods from different parts of the globe at much lower cost than before because of lower trade barriers. And at the same time that this demand for foreign labor was increasing, its supply was massively increasing with especially China coming out of socialism, uh, Eastern Europe coming out of communism. Okay, so these forces work together to generate a very, very marked increase in disintegration, uh, in the disintegration of production across borders. Now that raises the issue of you know, have these drivers not worked anymore and might they work in reverse? So let me move to point four, which is gonna focus on technological factors. Points four and five are gonna focus on technological factors. So the fourth point I wanna make, perhaps a bit controversially, is that I do think that technology will continue to be a complement of trade. It's gonna to continue to foster globalization. Why? Uh, do I uh, believe that? On the one hand, because the ICT revolution very much did, and although then we might be uh, reaching diminishing returns uh, on certain technologies that were associated with the ICT revolution, um, there are many other technologies that are coming out now that I think have the potential to foster uh, further globalization. What do I have in mind? I have in mind automation, industrial robots, 3D printing, but also digital technologies uh, and open distributed ledgers such as blockchain. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound right. Uh, when we think about industrial robots, automation, 3D printing, much has been written about the fact that these are technologies that unlike the ICT revolution are actually going to substitute for trade. They're gonna make it less necessary for firms in the West to hire labor abroad because they can get robots to do that at, uh, uh, without paying the high wages in the West. Now, I would argue that this is a conceptually, it's not entirely clear that that may be the case. And more importantly, empirically, it doesn't seem to be the case. So conceptually, the main issue here to remember is that robots do not produce things out of thin air. They need parts, components, raw materials to assemble goods. And to the extent that those materials are gonna continue to come from abroad, what might happen conceptually is that robotization, automation by increasing firm productivity might increase firm scale, might increase demand for inputs, and might actually increase demand for foreign imported intermediate inputs. Empirically, that's exactly what we've seen. There's work by the World Bank, more recent work by folks at Oxford that has shown that indeed firms that automate it or in industries where automation has been higher, if anything, we tend to observe increases in trade flows, uh, not uh, decreases. And that's why I believe that if you couple this with the more natural fact that digital technologies, digital platforms, blockchain are likely to be have a positive effect on trade, I am actually quite optimistic about the future of how technology is gonna shape trade. The fifth point I wanna make is more focused on one aspect of technology that is particularly revel relevant for global value chains, which is that in setting up global value chains, firms incur very large fixed costs, okay? They need to find suppliers, they need to build up plants, uh, buy machinery, there's a bunch of upfront investments that are associated with the creation of global value chains. As a result, firms rationalize those investments or, or, or their global value chains when they set them up. Even large companies don't have dozens of suppliers that provide the same type of good. Okay, so the existence of scale economies is quite important for understanding why global uh, uh, sourcing strategies, global value chain strategies are fairly, fairly uh, uh, um, limited. Okay, there's not a lot of players there. In addition, uh, those fixed costs are not only large, but they tend to be sunk in nature. Once I've set up a, a, a production plant, if I were to want to leave a country, it's very hard to recoup a big chunk of that investment, let alone the cost of finding suppliers, which are by their natural nature sunk. Because these uh, uh, investments are sunk, this has two very important implications. First, the exact decision of a firm of whether they want to start offshoring, say in China or not, is very different from the exposed decision of the, whether they want to pull out from that country. Because once they've invested, they, not, they basically would lose that initial investment where they want to reshore. And at the same time, reshoring is going to entail high fixed costs to create the new plant at home and find new suppliers at home. So the sun nature of 
investments creates this stickiness that makes GVCs or the geography of GVC not to react very fast to shocks to the world economy. Relatedly, um, because of the sunk nature of shocks, uh, 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 sorry, of global value chains, only shocks that are perceived to be persistent are likely to generate significant relocation of GVCs. You can have very, very significant temporary shocks, which uh, COVID might be an example of, but as long as the shocks are perceived to be temporary, you might not expect a lot of relocation following from them. Now, this is conceptually, I guess, empirically, there is evidence of this stickiness. Um, there's a bunch of papers that were written uh, uh, right after uh, the Great Recession. We had a very trade, large trade collapse. You have data here from France that shows you a very marked decline in trade flows around right after the Great Recession, late 2008 to early 2009. But most of that adjustment was at what we call the intensive margin. Trade relationships were not broken. There was no reshoring, no uh, finding domestic suppliers or anything like that. And that's what allowed, by the way, the world economy or world trade to uh, go back to normal, to pre-crisis levels, uh, not pre-trends, but pre-crisis levels uh, very fast, just because agents stuck together. And when things went back to normal, uh, they were able to reinitiate uh, trade flows in the same manner as before. So for this reason, I, uh, I like to remind people that empirical evidence from the Great Recession, also from the Asian financial crisis, by the way, indicates that even large shocks um, do, no, do not necessarily need to massive relocation of production. Now, let me turn to policy factors. Okay, so that's going to be my point. My following points are going to be about uh, the extent to which policy factors, which I've argued were very important in driving the hyper globalization period, are likely to uh, uh, are causing globalization and might actually lead to deglobalization. So, in that sense, uh, um, let me first point out the obvious, which is there are signs, there are clear signs of growing protectionism. I would highlight three main developments uh, that are particularly worrisome. The first one at the multilateral level is that multilateral liberalization uh, under the umbrella of the WTO is clearly at an impasse. The Doha round is based, it's, it's lasted years and years and it still hasn't been concluded. We've seen it more recently with the failure to appoint a director general at the WTO. So clearly, uh, that multilateral agenda is in trouble. What about the regional trade liberalization agenda, which was so important in the 90s? Uh, well, that has also largely stalled. And in fact, it seems to show some signs of retreat. Okay, so Brexit is a clear, it's a clear indication of a retreat from regional integration. At some level, the new NAFTA, the USMCA, is, is also a retreat from NAFTA. So uh, uh, it, this, I think, is particularly uh, uh, worrisome. And third, obviously, uh, there's the recent US-China trade war, uh, which has actually brought into place actual tariffs and, 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 and one, one, what might call a tariff wars. Now, these are the facts. Now, the issue is, is why is this happening? And we need to understand why this is happening, because only by doing so, we're going to be able to forecast the extent to which these things are likely to last or not. So it is tempting to say all this is just driven by politics and that some politicians chose to do that because of their private motives. I think that the consensus is that it's, the issues are much deeper than that. And I do believe that the combination of inequality and the lack of proper redistribution have been key for fostering the type of backlash against globalization that has given rise to the election of politicians that then carried out this sort of protectionist uh, policies. So you see that in, in this slide on the left panel, I'm plotting uh, uh, a measure of, of inequality in the US and a measure of trade openness. Uh, obviously that doesn't establish causation, but it's very clear that those things have been growing very much in parallel. On the right panel, I'm showing you a simple measure of US tax progressivity. And it's basically showing you that during the same period in which inequality was growing in the US and many other parts of the globe, at least in the US, the tax system was becoming less progressive and therefore doing a worse and worse job of, co of compensating those economic agents that were not necessarily benefiting from globalization. That led to discontent, and discontent led to people voting for uh, politicians and political parties that were less favorable to globalization. Now, obviously, that takes me to the issue, are these forces likely to go away? Is this just a fluke in the, in the last few years, or are these forces likely to stay? And again, here I'm a bit pessimistic in the sense that 
I do believe that we are likely to continue to see trait-induced inequality. That is, even in a world in which new technologies and better policy uh, uh, environments would lead to a, a continuation of globalization, if that globalization is fueled by automation, digital technologies, et cetera, this is likely to lead to a further increases in inequality. So unless governments uh, find a way to a better deal with those that are not benefiting from globalization, I do believe the backlash is going to continue to be there, and that will ultimately be reflected again in, in, in growing protectionism. Okay, so um, we might uh, uh, find ways to better redistribute or, or have more active labor uh, market policies that do a better job of, of, of mitigating discontent, but I, it's very hard to be optimistic uh, given our experience, at least in the US, uh, in, in recent uh, years. My last two points are going to be more focused on the ongoing uh, uh, COVID crisis. Okay, so there's much more we could talk about this. Maybe we can talk more in the Q&A, but I wanted to focus on two salient points that I think some are well known, maybe others are less so. The first one is on the short run. So, of course, COVID-19 was a very large shock. It led to essentially a halting of world trade during a few weeks in, uh, uh, in March and, uh, and in April. Um, and you see this in these two panels. Uh, on the left panel, I'm using uh, Dutch data from the CPV that is plotting indices of world trade and world industrial output. Very marked decrease at the beginning, the first few months of the year. Um, uh, but what's very important to point out is that things have recovered very quickly. Okay, The left panel only goes to um, August. The data is available with a lag, but you see that the recovery is, uh, has been quite fast. On the right panel, I'm using data that is a little bit less precise. It's based on satellite data that tracks the movement of ships around the globe. It's less precise, but it, you can get it at a much higher frequency and uh, uh, up to basically a, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago. The message from that right panel is very similar, very marked decrease uh, uh, in the initial phases of the crisis, but very fast increase. That figure is further breaking up trade flows into different types of trade flows using the fact that different types of goods are transacted with different types of ships. And you see, interestingly, that vehicles, which is the one type of good being transacted here that is particularly closely related to global value chains, experience a disproportionately large decline. So much of what was written early in the crisis about this is really bad for global value chains, it's an asynchronous shock, it's really creating lots of distortions, that is really born in the data. But check the recovery since then. The recovery has been very, very fast. And in fact, the levels of trade are now higher, uh, uh, according to this metric, uh, than they were at the beginning of the year. So if this, if we find a vaccine soon, if this proves to be a fairly temporary shock to the world economy, I do believe that trade flows are going to go back to normal in a, in a relatively uh, short amount of time. Finally, though, this has also been a very large shock, and it leads to rethinking. And uh, um, it is a shock that I think will, will have ramifications for the medium to long run. And my last point is really about outlining them. So first, I think that the decline in face-to-face -face interactions, the fact that I am in Boston, Massachusetts, and not in Centra, um, this is likely to persist. Um, obviously, in a less dramatic manner, I do think that I'll be on a plane at some point again in the future, but I do think that the shock to the airline industry and also the willingness of people to kind of uh, uh, travel as much as they did in the past is likely to be sev severely impacted. Now, to the extent that this international business travel is important for global value chain activity and for trade flows more broadly, I do think that we're going to have an effect in the long run. Now, having said that, I do. I am. I'm. I'm a. I'm a, I'm a big uh, uh, fan of technology. I do think that technology is going to react to this, and I do think that technical change is likely to make virtual interactions a better substitute for face-to-face -face interactions. Um, and that's going to be facilitated by the fact that this crisis has basically led, at this point in time, a very uh, marked increase in the market capitalization of. Of, of firms that are in this business. So hopefully they're, they'll use that windfall to actually try to improve technology in a matter that it can sustain production at long distances in a way that is smooth and a, a, a better substitute for face-to-face -face interactions. So I think the main worrisome I have actually more than on the technology front is more on the political landscape, okay? And, um, by that, I mean, 
I think that we've seen lots of uh, diplomatic tensions in this year as a result of the crisis, the fact that this uh, pandemic was referred as the China Wuhan virus here in the U.S. is not particularly helpful. Even in the EU, there's been a lot of tensions. It wasn't, it wasn't easy to pass an aid package. Um, so I think how we come out, how diplomacy, how international relations come out of this crisis is going to be quite central for figuring out the medium to long run effects of the pandemic. Similarly, and as President Lagarde pointed out earlier today, the effects on the pandemic have been quite dramatic on income inequality. It's, the pandemic has affected much more poorer individuals than richer individuals. So to the extent that inequality is going to brew uh, discontent and that part of that discontent is going to be targeted toward globalization, I think we are going to have to keep a close eye on this. I think it's not just that we should be saddened by the regressive uh, nature of the recession. I think we should also be worried about the policy and, and uh, implications of that for politics uh, in the future. So I'm almost out of time. Let me just conclude. Um, what I've argued is that it's not obvious that the world economy is deglobalizing, and I think we should more uh, uh, use the word slowalization rather than deglobalization. I've argued that it's hard to conclude that technological developments or that COVID per se are likely to fuel an era of deglobalization, but uh, I do believe that we are, might face some challenges for the future of globalization that are likely to be institutional and political in nature because of the role of technology and of COVID in uh, aggravating the forces that led to uh, recent sparks of protectionism in the world economy. And that's uh, all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you have adjusted uh, perfectly to the time that you had available. And now uh, uh, the paper is going to be discussed by Susan Lund, partner of McKinsey. And uh, the floor will be subsequently open to all participants. But now, Susan, you have the floor. Hello from Washington, DC. Thank you, and it's an honor to be here today. I'm going to start first by talking about what I agree with Professor Antras's paper. He's done a very nice job and made a real contribution to our understanding of the relationship between trade and GDP by saying that this was a natural regression to the mean after a period of hyperglobalization. He's convincingly shown that the factors that led to hyperglobalization, including uh, technological change, reduced trade costs, and new countries entering the world trade system, have run out of steam, so to speak. And then finally, if you read his paper, he provides a very nice theoretical model that includes fixed costs that both explains why we saw an acceleration in trade uh, in the 20 years between 1985 and 2005, um, but also uh, why that may uh, run out of steam and we may not see value chains move. So his conclusions, which I mainly agree with, are first, there's little evidence of systemic deglobalization. Second, that the main threat in the future are political and institutional issues getting in the way of globalization rather than an economic case. And third, that value chains are sticky and so therefore we may not see a lot of movement. On the last point, I'll have to re uh, respectfully disagree. So my comments today, I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to provide an alternative explanation for why we saw the slowdown in goods trade. And then I'm going to take a firm level view to look at the issue of risk and resilience and why that might cause some restructuring of global value chains. So first, this chart shows you the ratio of goods exports to goods gross output. The chart would look the same if we measured it relative to GDP. And what you see is the black line in the middle is the familiar picture of the slowdown in global trade where trade is declining as a share of gross output. But look at the line for China. The decline globally is almost entirely explained by China exporting less of what it produces. It's seen a dramatic reduction over the last 15 years. And when you look at other developed countries in the dotted blue line at the top, you see that the ratio continues to grow slowly and other emerging markets saw a dip, but again are more or less flat. So the question is, what's happening in China? Well, two things are happening in China. 
The left side of this chart shows you China's exports as a share of gross output in different industry value chains. So in computers and electronics in 2007, China was exporting 97% of what it produced. Uh, in 2018, it exported 61%. The reason is the rise of the Chinese consumer market. So China has a billion consumers that have higher income than they had 10 years ago. At the same time, China is a growing share of world trade. So Chinese consumers are consuming more. And you see this across different value chains shown here. Now on the right side of this page, China has done a second thing, which has started to develop its own domestic supplier ecosystems. So when China first entered the world trading system, it largely imported intermediate goods, it assembled final goods, then it re-exported them. Its share in the value added of trade was very low, but that's changed markedly over the last 10 years. So today you see that in different industries, well, again, I'll use the example of computers and electronics. Um, in 2007, China was importing nearly half of the inputs in, that it used uh, by 2017, it was importing only 19%. So it's developed its own domestic suppliers. And these two factors together mean that China is much more of a consumption, internally domestic focused economy, and it relies less on global trade. And this alone explains the slowdown. Now, at the same time, services trade continues to grow. And this is where I would agree globalization is not over, but perhaps it has a different trade. A different complexion. This shows you the growth rate of different types of services trade uh, over the last 12 years. And you see telecom and IT services are growing very rapidly, business services, intellectual property, uh, royalties, travel services, finance and insurance. It's all growing actually faster uh, than global goods trade over that same period, except for transportation, which is um, heavily linked to global goods trade. So the conclusion would be that, yes, we are definitely not in an era of deglobalization. The decline of goods trade relative to GDP is a sign of success rather than failure of globalization, and it reflects the natural development of China's economy. We might expect the slower growth of goods trade to GDP to continue as India and other developing countries follow the same path of developing their domestic markets. Um, third, services trade is growing faster than goods trade. And so what, there's no evidence of deglobalization, but rather a different type of globalization moving forward. Now, could value chains shift? This is getting more speculative, but we released a report in August called Risk, Resilience, and Rebalancing in Global Value Chains. It's research that we started at the McKinsey Global Institute a year ago before pandemics were part of our lexicon. I'll share some of the highlights. Point number one is that supply chains are not chains. They're actually complicated, interconnected networks of suppliers. This chart shows you the known tier one and tier two suppliers of Dell and Lenovo. And what you see is that they have thousands of suppliers each, um, roughly a quarter of which are shared between them, and that the suppliers interact with each other. So when a shock hits any one of the nodes in this network, it will be amplified throughout the network in unpredictable ways. Second point is that external shocks to global supply chains happen quite frequently. We did a survey of supply chain experts to find out how often is production disrupted. And what we found is that on average, it's quite frequently. So companies can expect a one to two week disruption in manufacturing production every two years. They can expect a one to two month disruption in production every 3.7 years. So while any single shock may not be persistent, the accumulation of all the different types of shocks out there, whether they are geophysical, hurricanes and typhoons, cyber attacks, pandemics, trade wars, uh, military conflict, and on and on, means that companies are being bombarded. This is no longer a once in a hundred year event or even a once in 10 year event. The third point then would be that this is very costly. When we look at um, the income statements and, and balance sheets of companies, we find that this, the, co the cost of, this, of these shocks over a decade would wipe out nearly half of the one year's EBITDA. And that's quite substantial. And this gives companies an idea of how much they could invest in resilience and still come out ahead.
in a, in a survey that we did of global executives uh, in the supply chain industry in May, after COVID broke out, we found not surprisingly that nearly all of them said building resilience was important, but maybe more surprisingly, 44% said that they would be willing to increase resilience and sustainability at the expense of short-term efficiency. Now, there are many ways to do that, and the list on the right shows you um, some of them. The most common is dual sourcing, and that simply means finding a second supplier for a critical input, ideally in a different location than the first supplier. Um, companies can hold more inventory. Uh, you'll see that many chose the option of nearshoring suppliers so that they can more closely manage them or regionalizing supply chains. Now, many of these actions do have to do with changing the geography of trade. And so my last chart would say that one implication of further regionalization and nearshoring would be that we might see supply chain shift. It will not be a short term move. Um, there are some costs and this takes time to identify new suppliers and invest in new capabilities in different locations. But when we look at a set of economic factors, including the extent to which there are fixed costs in industries, the extent to which you need specialized talent, um, and any evidence of movement already. And then we look at non-economic factors, like have governments around the world declared goods in this industry an essential good or important for national competitiveness? We came up with a very rough estimate and of course, it varies by different supply chain. But what you see is that you could imagine maybe 15 to 25% of global goods trade shifting to different sets of countries than where it sits today. Um, some industries like semiconductors, it would be driven entirely by non-economic factors and policy changes rather than a business case. Whereas an industry like apparel and textiles, uh, you see there's a strong business case and indeed production is already moving. None of this is to say that this means, quote, reshoring to Europe or the United States. Much of this production may move uh, from one country, for instance, China to Vietnam or the Philippines. But it does mean that there are um, potentially movement underway that countries and policymakers should be aware of and potentially companies as well. I am now out of time and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, now, before opening the, the floor to the audience, I would go back to uh, to Paul. Uh, I don't know wh whether Paul, you want to make some comments on, uh, you know, the 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 presentation made by Susan. Sure. Thanks, Luis. Um, so, thanks so much, Susan. That was a a, a great discussion. Um, I love it when a when a discussion uh, tells me that it doesn't. He or she does not fully agree with me because I know I'm going to learn something. <laughs> um, having said that, I, I think we agree on more, uh, 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 on more than uh, than I thought when you first said that there was some scope for disagreement. I think on point one, we essentially agree close to 100%. Um, yes, you kind of make some subtle points about services and the role of China moving up the value chain. Um, that's probably part of the story. Uh, we might disagree on, you know, what uh, what India is going to do, and you know, I think it's likely to go first through a phase of globalization, further globalization, than before moving up the value chain. Uh, but it's sort of small stuff. On the second point, I, I do th I, I do 100% agree with you that anything we say at this point is speculative. So uh, um, your guess is as good as mine, I guess. Um, I would just point out that, you know, what. You know, I, and and you know, it, it may well be the case that we're on the cusp of big changes that I'm not foreseeing, and and that past empirical evidence um, is not relevant uh, at this point in time. But you know, I looking at what I've seen from past shocks, or, or even more recently, you know, you mentioned resilience, and you know, we had a big earthquake in Japan in 2011. There's been flooding in Thailand. There's been large shocks to global value chains. And we have failed, you know, I'm sure that has triggered many discussion on boardrooms about what needs to be done. And, you know, 70% of people say we should be doing that or that, but you start crunching numbers and it just, it's not happening. And it's not happening, I think, because uh, because of this fixed cost, the sunk cost that basically lead firms to say, okay, you know what, now we're, we've passed the shock. So let's try to ride this a little bit longer. Um, we also see it in, and I didn't mention this, but beyond the sort of the big shocks that uh, 
that that uh, uh, the Great Recession and this earthquakes and so on, which of course have short time effects. It's more about the relocation after. I would also argue that having looked at U.S. data, like very detailed micro level, firm level data in the U.S., this issue of even uh, by sourcing or dual sourcing, it is very infrequent. I mean, we can see exactly with census customs data the extent to which certain firms in the U.S. are buying, are bringing into the U.S. the same input from various sources. And, and we just don't see an awful lot of that. It's true that it happens, and it's true that it's the largest companies, the big chart you had there, they do some of that, for sure. But the, the median firm in the U.S. is nowhere near doing anything close to dual sourcing. So, and I think there is, I'm, I'm just pointing out that there's a good reason for this. COVID is going to lead to lots of discussions in the boardroom about resilience and this and that. I'm just, I'm a little bit less clear that it's actually going to materialize into action anytime soon. But of course, there's long-term factors. And I talk a little bit about those in the paper. In the long run, long, many things can happen. But I would not expect a massive deglobalization or significant relocation of production in the next, say, five years. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. OK, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, now you know the floor is open for the audience, for the different participants. I think that we, we have no questions yet. I don't know whether you know anybody wants to, to raise their virtual hands. I think that we have started to receive some questions. Well, while we're, while we're waiting for questions, I'd be happy uh, to respond to one of your points, Paul. Uh, I do think that we agree mainly. As we look forward, though, I think that we do see evidence that trade moves slowly over time to different sets of countries. Um, in the case of the Japan tsunami in 2011, Toyota itself, which was the father of lean manufacturing and just-in-time production, decided to fully regionalize to the extent that it could uh, production networks, because that tsunami took out um, critical components that were distributed to Europe and North America. And so global production went down. After that, uh, they actually moved to fully regionalize and insulate three different regional supply chains, Asian, European, uh, and North America. And so in 2016, when we had another earthquake in Japan, uh, global production did not go down. Now in the aggregate macro data, I agree, we don't see trade flows going down because often in North America, production moves to Mexico. So it's still a trade flow, but it was important for Mexico. <laughs> and uh, it was an example of, I think, production moving, but this doesn't mean an end to globalization. It's just a different set of countries perhaps playing. Thank you very much, yes. Susan. Uh, I think that we have uh, you know, the first question uh, by Wolf uh, Guntram from Bruegel. Wolf, uh, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I really wanted to ask a question on the China numbers, which I found quite striking. I mean, the fact that China and China's um, uh, globalization has decreased. At the same time, we know that China um, is building very um, uh, consciously its value uh, chains um, around the Belt and Road Initiative and is uh, building essentially supplier networks. And I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, what's the evidence really on um, the, the relative importance of the value chains that China is building and the fact that it seems to um, become less, less open and less engaged um, externally. And the other quick point um, that I would like to raise concerns um, uh, the um, what I would call sometimes uh, protectionist instincts that now exist um, in some capitals, including in the capital of Europe in, in Brussels, um, where um, there has been, uh, so there is a policy discourse that, um, you know, one of the lessons we, we should draw is really that our value chains have become uh, very vulnerable and, you know, we need to basically uh, reshore uh, and especially when it comes to medical supplies, uh, we need to reshore um, because otherwise we are very vulnerable to, uh, to, to future shocks. And I was wondering whether the panelists would like to comment on, 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 this, uh, on this phenomenon as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolf, uh, uh, Paul and Susan. Paul. Susan, you want to start with the China question and then I'll take the other one maybe? Or? So the China question is a really good one about the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative. 
Um, so two thoughts. One is that currently it's too small to be picked up in the China uh, goods exports numbers. Certainly there's some machinery and equipment. A lot of what they're exporting though is construction services um, and other sorts of services to actually build various uh, infrastructure projects. Um, but you, we'd have to look at the details of what they're exporting. So my hunch is that exports of things like mobile phones and, and clothing have gone way down and maybe there's been an uptick in some types of industrial goods exports to Belt and Road country. But overall, I think so far it's been relatively small and a lot of that would fall under services trade. Thank you, so Susan. On the, uh, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Paul, please. Sorry. Uh, on the issue of, of the reshoring of uh, you know, related to medical and, and health products and, uh, uh, and so on, I, I think that's a good point. I, I do think this is such a massive shock um, that is going to lead um, governments to try to kind of make efforts to develop this industries locally in the, in the expectation of, of future pandemics, which might take 80 years, but uh, you know, having gone through this, I'm, I'm sure that's going to prompt action. This is more generally the case. I mean, governments try to kind of make sure they can secure a minimum amount of production of goods that are perceived to be essential for, say, national security. Um, and that's, that's not new. What's going to change is what exactly are we going to realize now is, is things that are essential for national security. So there is going to be some action. I do believe that as important, crucial as they are right now, I mean, in terms of sort of aggregate magnitude, um, I don't think this is going to be huge moving forward. But um, but it, it is definitely, a, I, I, I agree with, with, that, with that possibility. Thank you. We have a second, uh, a second question. Uh, it's going to be posed by Lorenzo Codogno. Lorenzo. You have the floor, the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. You seem to be very optimistic about uh, the future of globalization and, and especially technology. Um, don't you think that uh, the kind of technological developments that we have seen over the past few years might inevitably lead uh, to quasi monopoly power for some companies? that uh, that would, uh, would would basically produce uh, political conflicts and uh, protectionism good question lorenzo paul susan happy to weigh in uh, um i yeah i maybe i came across as super optimistic during the presentation i am actually and i do think that for the reasons that i mentioned uh there is going to naturally going to be a complementarity between technology and trade I do touch upon some of the issues you raised in the paper. The fact that uh, global value chain activity uh, naturally through an, an automation and, and, and new technologies, um, the way they might raise trade is by actually raising input demand, which is driven by increases in the optimal scale of firms. So this same conceptual framework that explains the complementarity tells me that large firms are gonna become larger, small firms are gonna become smaller. And that's obviously going to interact with market power. So we might want to think about uh, uh, antitrust issues that might be particularly uh, uh, relevant in this new age. Um, similarly, I do touch upon uh, the issue of the backlash that that's, uh, that might lead, uh, because uh, you know the market power, the influence of these companies, the inability of governments to uh, 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 make sure that these companies are not shifting profits to lower uh, corporate tax rate uh, jurisdictions. This is only likely to, the demands on regulators are only likely to go up. So if there's no response on the regulation side, I agree, fully agree that that might lead to increased tensions. And if the tensions are not dealt with, might lead to protectionism. So that's, that is a concern I have, but again, it's more of a policy concern and that, that's where I describe it in the paper. Susan, you wanna? Win. Yeah, I would add to that that I think that technology, uh, first of all, there are there's lots of academic research showing that it is leading to a superstar effect across industries where the largest firms can invest the most, they uh, gain market share and get larger. So that is definitely um, an issue that we need to grapple with. And I think at the same time, though, one of the things that automation, AI, blockchain, all these things do is reduce the uh, importance of labor costs. In trade now, 
Paul has argued there's no evidence, which may be right, that this has completely substituted for trade. But I think going forward, what it means at a micro level is that firms consider different things when they consider where to put production or suppliers. And it's no longer wage costs that are the driving importance in most types of manufacturing. Um, rather, it's access to skilled talent, it's uh, protection of intellectual property rights, it's quality of infrastructure. Um, and so it's a different set of factors rather than purely low wages for most types of manufacturing and textiles and apparel, furniture would be the remaining very labor intensive industries where wage costs play a role. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to both of you. I think that we had, uh, you know, a third uh, participant, Livio Estraca. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Vice President, and thanks for the for the great presentation, Paul. Uh, very insightful. I have a question about the stickiness of GVCs. Um, sorry, yeah, I have a question about the stickiness of uh, of GVCs. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, the sunk cost as being um, uh, relevant. Um, I just understand. So I understand the argument of fixed cost uh, of establishing a, a, you know, a new a new trade relationship, but I'm not sure I understand the sunk cost. So are, are you implying that the decision is uh, is backward looking as opposed to forward looking? I mean, we all we all learn in graduate school that sunk cost should be relevant in theory. So the decision should be forward looking one. So I, I just wanted to to ask you to, to elaborate on uh, on this. Uh, argument the sunk cost matter for the stickiness of GVCs. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful you raised this. I mean, when you, when you have limited time, you have to explain things quickly and some, some things uh, then uh, are, not, are not fully clear. The argument I'm making is the following. Um, I'm making the argument that when you're deciding to, you know, set up a new plan or have a new supplier in a new country, in order to create that link, often you need to incur significant upfront costs. Okay, so that's the fixed cost argument. Initially, think uh, in the 70s and 80s, early 80s, firms were largely in the West, say, and then they started making these decisions to go abroad. And for some large companies, it was a no-brainer, and they did that because they could lower costs. But for smaller companies, even though they knew that wages were lower there, they just couldn't make it work because the initial investment was too large for them to bear. So that fixed cost basically led to globalization, but limited local or selective globalization, only the large firms went. The point I'm making is that because these fixed costs are sunk, once you've made the investment, once you've gone to China or you've gone to Thailand, if you're thinking about reshoring, the high fixed cost option is no longer uh, offshoring, it's actually reshoring. That is, when you're deciding whether to stay in Thailand or go back to the US, what the fixed costs you're, uh, that you're, you're going to incur, those are going to be related to reshoring, not to offshoring. So that completely changes. You know, it could have been the case that uh, initially you went to Thailand because wages were low. Now wages in Thailand are up. And initially at that new wage, you wouldn't have gone to Thailand. But now that you're there, you might as well stay. And you might actually not want to reshore because that fixed cost that you initially paid, you cannot recoup. You cannot sell the factory and the machines at face, you know, at, at the at the at the value that uh, is relevant for you because maybe they're specialized and and their alternative use is not as as profitable. So that's, I mean, that, hopefully that's a bit clearer. Uh, uh, but but that's what I have in mind. That is, it's not a fixed cost that you can recoup the moment you leave a country. Good, Susan. Do you want to add anything? Um, no, I will leave, I'll leave that one. Okay, good. Well, I think that we do not have, uh, oh, there is another one, you know, they are coming. So we have to wait a little bit. Christine Forbes, uh, Christine, you have the, the, the floor for your question. So Susan and Paul, very nice presentations. So both of you, no. Both of you focused on globalization as measured by trade flows and global value chains. And I was wondering if you would comment on globalization as measured by capital flows and how that interacts with trade and global value chains. 
As I'm sure you know, global capital flows have fallen much more sharply than trade flows since 2008. A major factor behind that was the contraction in global banking flows, particularly in Europe. Um, and there's also been a shift in the form of global capital flows, where a smaller share is bank lending and a larger share is international debt issuance. So I was just wondering if you could talk about how those trends may have affected the globalization and trade and going forward, if global capital flows remain muted, how that might affect the developments in trade and global value chains going forward. Thank you, Christine. Paul, Susan. I'm happy to answer that. So I think that's a great observation, uh, but I think that to use Paul's term, what we saw in global capital flows prior to 2008 was hyper-globalization. And a lot of it was bank lending, as you point out, and even interbank lending. And a lot of that uh, was between European nations with the creation of a single market. Um, and so when some of that went away uh, after the financial crisis, maybe that was a bubble and now we've reverted to long-term trend. I think that going forward, it's gonna be interesting to look at foreign direct investment. So if my assertion is correct, and over the next five years, we do see companies decide to start to shift some of the geographic footprint of their supplier base, you might see more foreign direct investment. You can also see, you can already see some of the pickup, for instance, in Mexico, where a lot of the Asian contract manufacturers like Foxconn and Flex um, and others are expanding production in Mexico, for instance, to serve the, the US and North American market. So uh, this period of value chains being at play may lead to more foreign direct investment. However, it's important to remember that offshoring was also accompanied by outsourcing. So the number of captive supplier plants around the world is only um, a small share of the total supplier base. So switching production often doesn't mean that you shut down a factory in China or Thailand and build one somewhere else. It simply means you look for a supplier in a different country, you get to know them, companies qualify them, and then you start shifting orders. And then if that is the case in those industries, then you wouldn't necessarily see an impact on pickup of in capital flows. Thank you very much, Susan. I think that we have, uh, you know, uh, time for one additional question. Jim Bullard. Jim. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to comment. I want to press Paul on his first point about um, the limits of global uh, trade, because I think this is fundamental. Uh, you've had this period of hyper-globalization, and what do we really expect to happen uh, going forward? At what point will we be to the equilibrium amount of global trade? I've challenged my staff to think about uh, Europe is a big integrated area, North America is a big integrated area, and China is a big integrated area. How much trade do we really expect to occur between these three blocks? Uh, do we expect it to be ever increasing? And the chart seems to say, well, you know, maybe that 30% number is, you know, is getting closer. Uh, but I think this is fundamental to how we think about, uh, you know, that coming out of the 80s and 90s, we've always wanted to say, well, more trade is going to be better. So uh, I have one suggestion, which is uh, the U.S. states uh, don't even keep track of their trade deficits, uh, completely free trade across borders. I think there are some trade barriers with across states, but we don't even keep track of them. That would give you some metric for what you could expect ultimately from uh, from global trade and get some idea of whether we're close or far away from uh, what we uh, eventually expect. So this is something that's not often talked about, but I want to press Paul on this. Paul? Thanks, Jim. Uh, I, yeah, I can definitely take this. Um, I, I do comment very briefly on that on the paper, but it's a good point. I mean, and as, as, as you're hinting, the best, way, the best way to answer this is just consider some extreme, say, counterfactuals. What, happen, what would happen if, on the one hand, you move to completely free trade? Um, and, and the answer to that of what the ratio of trade to economic activity would be, as you're hinting, is a function of just how large are the blocks that are trading with each other relative to not trading with each other. 
uh, or more generally, if you think about countries all trading freely with each other, it's going to matter the dispersion of size. And there's some natural upper limit. Even in a free trade world, we wouldn't expect 100% of what's produced to be exported. Now, since you raised this issue, I, I need to raise a subtle issue that I kind of bypassed uh, uh, during the presentation, which is we need to be a bit careful when plotting things like the world trade to world GDP ratio in the sense that the numerator and the denominator are not in the same units. The numerator is a gross output sales measure. GDP is a value added measure. And it could be the case, and it is a case for some countries where trade is actually higher. Exports might be higher than their national product just because they bring a lot of foreign inputs that then they embody in their exports and the gross value of their exports is much larger than the value added content of their exports. So that the reason I mentioned this is because when that one does counterfactuals, you need to bear that in mind. It could be the case that even though there's an upper limit in the share of activity that can be exported, uh, to the extent that the world production becomes more and more fragmented and we use more and more foreign value added uh, in our exports and we, uh, you know, goods go through many stages across countries, the gross value of trade flows could actually grow a lot. Uh, even if the value added content of those experts uh, does not. And that's something that uh, you might want to take into account in some kind of factuals. Uh, alternatively, you can, you can be a bit more kosher than I was and plot things that, uh, sort of comparing apples to apples and compare trade flows to gross output, for instance. Um, and I don't do that just because it's so typical and so widespread the use of trade to GDP ratios that I did that here, but that's something that I would tell your folks that are running those kind of factors to be a bit uh, mindful of. Susan, do you want to add anything before closing? No, that's a very good point there. Um, uh, this is why the chart that I showed you was relative to gross output in which uh, trade can be higher um, for particular countries than 100%. Well, thank you very much for both of, uh, of you. It has been, you know, uh, you know, great interventions. Uh, I, I retain, you know, that uh, Paul, you have uh, coined uh, the, the term as globalization. Uh, I, I think that is going to be patented because I think that is a very good description of, uh, you know, the, the main message of your presentation. So thank you very much again to both of you. Thank you very much uh, to all the participants. And uh, now I turn again, uh, you know, the floor to Thierry. Uh, that is going to give us some indications as how to we are going to, to proceed uh, over the next uh, the next minutes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Vice President, and, and thank you all of you for uh, that interesting session and taking us through the sort of the global picture and globalization. Um, of the next 15 minutes, good news is we will have a, a short break. We will resume at um, 3:45 sharply. And perhaps I would like to say, well, if, if you uh, would like to use this 15 minutes wisely, please do have a look again at our website with the papers and the posters of the Young Economists. And for the participants in particular, uh, please, of course, feel free to cast your votes. So see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you.